Another book I wanted to talk about, which I don't actually have a physical copy for you uh, to show you, um, is a book by probably the most famous Canadian literary critic of the 20th century by the name of Northrop, Northrop Frye. Uh, if you know any book by Northrop Frye, it's probably a book called The Anatomy of Criticism, which is still pretty widely read in uh, humanities courses. Um, if he's known for a second book, it's probably the one I'll be talking about right now, which is called The Great Code, The Bible and Literature. Um, this was a really, really superb book, and it sort of reconfigured the way I think about the Bible as a literary document, not as a religious one or as one of revelation, but just as a literary document. After two centuries of historical criticism, of, of narrative, narrative criticism, as it's called when it's applied to the Bible, it's uh, pretty refreshing to see a whole new interpretive methodology w which looks inward at the Bible instead of trying to test its significance by how well it correlates to something outside of itself, um, like trying to test its historicity or its reliability against uh, known events in history. So it really takes the Bible on its own ground. Uh, and that's the central thesis of Fried's argument and what he tries to do here, that the Bible is a unified mythology, uh, replete with its own literary devices that hardly need confirmation from history or archaeology to successfully tell its own story, or mythos. And by the way, when I call it a mythology, that's not some sort of, you know, pejorative that I'm throwing out there against Christian or against Christianity. Um, the word mythology I'm just taking straight from from the Greek word mythos, which means a story or a narrative. Uh, and because of this, the book has been the the target of a number of appropriate historicist critiques, all claiming that one can't uh, wholly separate the work of literature from its social and cultural context. Although these criticisms aren't all fair themselves, uh, as Fry even considers the structure of certain metaphors, like the ubiquitous um, flood myth, uh, to modulate themselves repeatedly via literary transmission in new texts. The first part of the book um, consists of a highly condensed theory of language, which Fry employs in the second half. And I found this part just as useful, yet often uh, elided in a lot of critical reviews. It's, it's very important. Uh, according to Fry, his own ideas are highly influenced by Vico's uh, Cienza Nuova, uh, which posits the idea that um, there is a cyclical theory of language that he has, where in each human epoch, um, we use language in a unique, irreducible way. So he has this tripartite interpretation. Uh, there's the hieroglyphic stage in which words have the pure energy of potential magic. And then there's the hieratic stage in which words begin to reflect an objective reality of a transcendent order. And there is the demotic stage where prose continues its subordination to the, quote, induce, inductive and fact-gathering process, end quote, and seems to be the stage in which we remain today. If this evolution has taken us full circle from feeling the pure immediacy of metaphor, how are we supposed to read the Bible, whose language is, of course, one of pure metaphorical immediacy? That question, too, lies at the center of the book. Nietzsche said that God had lost his function, but Vico and Fry, in turn, might have replied that the Bible is something simply entombed in a lost part of the cycle, uh, inaccessible and unable to be interpreted by our demotic stage of language in which we rest today, uh, because it was written in another stage. Uh, so, so Fry's neo-Viconian theory of language, if you want to call it that, goes some way in offering a theory for the vulgarism that so often takes the name of biblical interpretation. Uh, he says, with 
the general acceptance of demotic and descriptive criteria in language, such literalism becomes a feature of anti-intellectual Christian populism. The, the second part uh, begins the actual literary criticism as one would more formally recognize it. According to Fry, the Bible can operate independently precisely because it functions and maintains its own body of rhetorical devices, including metaphor, type, antitype, and archetype. Quote, we clearly have to consider the possibility that metaphor is not an incidental ornament, but one of its controlling modes of thought. Metaphor and trope become the sole measure of the Bible's inner verbal consistency. The type and antitype are essentially uh, important. He construes the entire Bible as a series of musical call and response gestures between the Old and the New Testament. The resurrection is the response to the Old Protestant, or excuse me, the Old, old Protestant, the Old Testament promised land. The baptism in the River Jordan is the New Testament's Andrew answer to the Old Testament's Red Sea, etc. He also integrates a number of other complex typologies, including the creation, incarnation, death, descent to hell, harrowing of hell, resurrection, ascension to heaven motif, and a nomenclature of types, including demonic, analogical, and apocalyptic. This universe, or multiverse even, of complex metaphor, meaning, and type are ones that we continue to recognize, read, and struggle with today, which accounts for the fact that myth goes a long way in exploring who we are and what we do as a community. Notice how Fry deftly bypasses any theological or strictly philosophical concerns when it comes to the Bible. That's because he's not interested in it as a religious document. He's just interested in it as a literary document. As Frank Kermode would comment almost a decade, a decade after the book was published, he said, just as he exiled questions of value from the anatomy of criticism, he exiles from his biblical criticism questions of belief. I was considering giving this book four out of five stars because of my occasional disagreements with it, including the arguments from historicism that I mentioned above, separating the culture and the religion from the actual textual artifact itself. But I can't in good conscience do that. Uh, just for the interpretive vistas that it opens up, uh, I feel that anything less than five stars would convey an impression that I was really less than impressed, which is certainly not the case. And if you're interested in literary criticism, especially as it's applied to the Bible, um, and you have some kind of background in in, liter or in biblical history and uh, in literary criticism, certainly pick this up if you haven't already. It's it's quite a book.